Uh, no, no, it's fine. Uh, so, so I'll. Uh, so what I was saying, uh, Sanjoy, was that I have to take this uh, issue of uh, policy to the to the to the right quarters, and I've been given a time this weekend only. So it's a good thing. Uh, whatever emerges from this meeting uh, will actually be uh, uh, you know written out, and uh, and I'll take it. Plus the inputs, Sanjoy, which you sent, and perhaps which you'll be sending in a day or two. Yeah, I'll that understand. also would form part. So I think by Friday we would have actually, as you've been rightly insisting on the policy aspect, uh, and it's coming very timely. So I think we'll be okay. Cool. I'll send you yeah. that. <laughs> Sanjay, you got honored by White House. I'm told. Yeah. Well, I didn't. The Salambala Trust, the trust that I set up. Uh, has so I, I I received it by accident. Let me put it like that. <laughs> Great. Yeah, but, it was, but I must say uh, it was quite a funny incident. But I'll tell you the incident later. <laughs> because when they called me, I was like, "Paise hai nahi, so I'm coming. Paise nahi." So they felt. So, abhi jaoge kaise? Nee nee, ho gaya, ho gaya, mil gaya. Mil gaya. So that was done through a, through a digital I have to class. I to be on mute when you're not talking. Please, just a second there. Yeah. All our panelists, I request everybody to be on mute when you're not talking. And you can unmute yourself because that will be convenient for you. Is that okay? Yeah. Good evening, sir. Uh, we are still in practice mode. It is not draped, no? it's streamed live. Uh, we yeah, have yes. another four minutes. Do you do? We'll what start? we can do is, is what start? we can do is, we'll have a uh, a small mock. How who is going to start first? Uh, how do you go? Okay. Okay. So I will. Uh, so if I do this, suppose if it is gone off, yeah. and all I need to do is tap this, and then come. Yeah. Right. Okay. Hmm. So when you move forward, you get cut off. When you move Who'll forward, be? yeah, yeah. Yeah, now uh, you're cut off this much. So yeah. Who's going to start, sir? First, who's going to start? So, I love this uh, background. Where are you? Japan, snowing. Oh, no. That's a virtual background. <laughs> I used a virtual background, so it's actually Japan only. <laughs> Video from Japan. Okay, what I will do is I just, we still are practice mode. I'm not, it's not going live. So, Exactly another three minutes. I'll go. I'll enable live for you. Uh, this program will be streamed live in your YouTube, uh, sorry, Facebook account. I made the settings, and uh, the social media team of uh, Culture Ministry need to look into the questions. And uh, any queries comes in Facebook Live that could be passed on to the panelists in this session. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make Raghavendra sir as one of the co-hosts, and. Uh, uh, who is anyone is making any presentation? Anyone is attempting to make any presentation? Yes, I am. Uh, I Thanks, am. Sir. Now I'm going to make you as because uh, only four of us can write have the rights to make presentation. Anyone else? I I am actually presenting it. On, I'm, we have got some opening slides, some welcome slides. Okay. And, right? In that case, I, I just want to know. going to make. Yes, sir. Hi. The sound is getting cut in between. You know, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. So I will be hosting this session as an anchor. I'm starting. We must start now. Go live in another one minute. Four twenty-nine. We put up a slide. I'll be doing all the sharing, which also includes the presentation from the thing. Right. Okay. So now what we will do is I'm going to this post. And uh, just uh, there is, once I make you post, you will see a button called broadcast. I request both of you don't touch the button broadcast because whatever we are informally doing will be visible to the attendees if you moment you press the button now. No broadcast. I'm making you, Mr. Lalit, as a co-host. Thank you. So I will be able to screen share, right? Yeah. But yeah. I don't. I don't have a, this thing button called podcast. It says participants. No. Now you will see, sir. I can. I'm. See, I've got broadcast, it. Broadcast, but I don't have to broadcast anything. No, no, don't touch that. Don't touch that. 
Okay. Now you please share your PPT, sir. If you are attempting to share any PPT, with no, 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 no. I don't have it. Lalit has it. Lalit. Lalit, sir, play. Can you? Can you? Lalit, sir, can you? You want me to play it now? Yes. There will be a share button. Yeah. I hope you'll be very comfortable with the tool. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Mr. Rao, what Facebook site is this being uh, broadcast on? This is our. Uh, sir, uh, this is actually Culture Ministry's website, sir. Okay. Thank you. So this is our opening slide which we want to go now. Okay, great, sir. You have any videos to share? There's no video. There's only slides. Oh, is great. I think I'm able to see that. These are the slides when I introduce every panel. And this right. is a presentation which is a single initiate. Great, great, great. So, okay, sir. Then uh, we are good to go. Now what I will do is uh, I will actually go for a broadcast. Start the broadcast now, please. Uh, I will go for broadcast and I'll also do the moment I broadcast. Wait for one at least thirty seconds. You will see Facebook live on left corner of your screen. Then you can start. I'm going mute. I'm going. Uh, uh, I'm disabling my video. Anything is required. Use the chat window. Panelist, I'm just giving you text. I just ask me any help, any technical support you require. Thanks, Rao. Welcome, sir. All the best. Have a great show. Thank you. So good evening friends namaskar and my name is lalit ghatani and i'm really honored to welcome you all to this webinar revitalizing museums and cultural spaces isn't it a very intriguing title and i'm sure that with our great panelists a very interesting conversation is awaited so this webinar is presented by development of museums and cultural spaces ministry of culture government of india and is powered by shokra productions and culture we would also like to thank our industry partners fikki and ema for their contribution in helping to prepare a white paper on the subject of today's webinar would request all attendees here to kindly post their questions in the q and a box and we shall try to take as many of them as possible once again requesting all attendees to kindly post your questions in the q and a box and we would like to address take them as much as we can as i had said earlier that we have a great set of panelists and all of us are eager to hear the conversation so let's get started and i am so very privileged to introduce them friends let me start with the man behind this initiative the man who talks walks sleep and works for the development of museums and cultural spaces it's my privilege to welcome shri raghavendra singh and now i'm just talking a little bit about mr singh mr singh is currently secretary and ceo development of museums and cultural spaces ministry of culture government of india he was a member of the indian administrative service and prior to his current assignment was secretary culture secretary textiles government of india he headed the prestigious national archives of india served as central drought relief commissioner and also as the secretary to the leader of opposition in rajya sabha and also as the private secretary to union external affairs minister he has also served as osd to the union finance minister and was also stationed as director of the indian cultural center berlin germany he has served the sector of tourism culture for over a decade and over 20 iconic buildings were restored directly under his supervision including the national gallery of modern art british barracks at red fort the victoria memorial and old currency building in kolkata he curated over 25 permanent exhibitions 
museums and galleries of which some examples are that of man mahal in varanasi national library kolkata museum of indian cinema mumbai and the national museum galleries new delhi his passion to refurbish old structures and thereafter create museums in them has encouraged the movement of museology as yet a nascent area in india he plans to extend this initiative to cities like gwalior bhopal lucknow jammu bangalore hyderabad and many such more cities and now let me introduce our next panelist abhishek podar abhishek is a prominent collector and patron of the arts in india he has been collecting art since high school and has and has uh, sorry he has been create i'm so sorry he has been collecting art since high school and has created a significant collection of south asian art craft and antiquities including modern and contemporary art and photography he is the force behind the upcoming museum of art and photography in bangalore where he is a trustee and to which he donated the initial leadership gift and a substantial portion of the family's art collection besides being on various boards and committees in india abhishek currently serves on the advisory committee of the india europe foundation for new dialogues headquartered in rome and has in the past served on the advisory committees of both national gallery of modern art bangalore and on the lincoln center global advisory council well all of us remember the kochi banale and those who have been fortunate to visit the same would have i'm sure would have fond memories ladies and gentlemen our next panelist is bose krishna machari bose is an artist and independent curator he lives and works between mumbai and kochi his diverse artistic and curatorial practice includes drawing painting sculpture design installation and architecture bose krishna machari is the co-founder of the kochi biennale foundation the organization behind the initiation of india's first biennale the kochi museum biennale in 2012 which he also co-curated he has served as president and biennale director of the foundation till date overseeing four successful editions of the biennale so far he is a board member of the international biennale association and also an academic board member of the toxichuan china arts and sciences project and we now move on as they say culture relates to objects and is a phenomenon of the world our next panelist today is from the other side of the world brendan stiako good morning brendan as it's what 7ish in the morning in boston really good morning uh, great to have you so thank you for having me it is 7 o'clock in the morning i'm really delighted to be here super so brendan siako is the founder and ceo of fusium a platform that helps museums and cultural organizations engage their visitors members and patrons siako <laughs> has been building technology since the age of 11 and has been recognized by inc magazine as being one of america's top entrepreneurs under 30 siako has been featured in the new york times wired fast company entrepreneur tech crunch venture beat esquire and pc magazine for his work in design technology and business in addition psycho currently sits on the steering committee of the museum council at the museum of fine arts boston and the community advisory board for the massachusetts international festival of the arts he holds five patents in the area of mobile technology and talking about the world The last panelist on our panel today is the man who has taken Indian culture to all parts of the world. Please welcome Sanjoy Roy. Sanjoy, an entrepreneur of the arts, is the managing director of Teamwork Arts, which produces over 25 highly acclaimed performing arts, visual arts, and literary festivals across 40 cities in countries such as Australia, Canada, Egypt, France, Germany, Hong Kong, Italy, Singapore, South Africa. Spain, UK, and USA, including the world's largest free literary gathering, the annual Z Jaipur Literature Festival. Roy has received the National Award for Excellence and Best Director for the film Shah Jahan Nabad, the Twilight Years. He is a founder trustee of Salam uh, Sal Salam Bala Trust, working to provide support services for street and working children in the inner city of Delhi, where over 55,000 children have benefited from education. training and residential services in 2011 the white house presented salam bala trust the us president's committee of arts and humanities award for an international organization 
So I worked mm -hmm. with various industry bodies on important policy issues within the culture space in India and is a senior office bearer on several committees working on policy infrastructure for the creative industries. He is co-chair of the Art and Culture Committee of the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry City and also the president of Event and Entertainment Management Association. A very warm welcome. A very warm welcome to all our panelists. And now I'd like to request the Agvain Singh to start this conversation and sharing his thoughts on why he thought of this initiative. Good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry, Sanjay, they missed your uh, your shot out in the sense that you were not actually shown on the screen when um, your various achievements were being read out. Uh, I actually look after a newly created post in the government of India, which is called the development of museums and cultural spaces. The government has in its wisdom thought of giving priority to this particular segment and especially uh, in the days of COVID, I thought it was most timely to, to discuss what we have actually come to discuss today. It is actually quite coincident that it also happens to be an international museum day. So we thought we'd discuss or start the discussion today, but otherwise, I was going to do it anyways, because the idea is not to just hold one more webinar, but to have some concrete takeaways from what we are just going to discuss. It would actually uh, be all noted down, believe you me, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and would be turned into a paper for policy initiatives. And then depending on how practical or workable they are, we will try and convert all this into some kind of a policy. And as I said, the days are challenging and we need to do something immediately. You see, traditionally, we have actually considered uh, initiatives in the field of culture to be either taken up by the state like a patron or through the initiatives of philanthropists, uh, be they from corporate sector or from the private sector. Now the funding landscape to my mind is fundamentally going to change uh, post COVID. And what makes for a sustainable business model is what we are actually here to discuss. I have, ladies and gentlemen, a very short presentation. It's not all that short in terms of slides, but believe you me, I'm not going to take much of your time. I'm going to go through it very quickly so that you get a sense of what we are planning to do or what we are already doing and, 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 and help you visualize the thing much better. So Lalit, can we have the presentation on? Next. Uh, so there are some of these buildings which we have actually restored. This building, old currency building, was made in 1833 and this is on the Dalhousie Square or what is known as the BBD Bar uh, of Kolkata. Next. Next. So when we took over, this was in 2018, this is how the work got initiated. And this is just about barely two years back. Next. Next, uh, what had happened was that the CPWD in 1980s was given the charge of actually dismantling this building, but thankfully the building remained, but without the roof, which was actually truly magnificent. Uh, so this building has a courtyard, which is actually open to the sky. Next, this is how the restored place looks. Next. This is how it looks inside. We have actually an exhibition 
uh, on the uh, Bengal art. Uh, it has 13 galleries and we'll go through them quickly. Next, this is how the corridors look. We have professional lighting, etc. Now we come to another building again. Go ahead. Now we come to another building which is uh, uh, called the Belvedere. This used to be a, a building where the Lieutenant Governor of Bengal would stay. And uh, whenever the Viceroy subsequently visited, uh, he would stay after <clears throat> next. So this is how it was when we took over. And again, this was about uh, one and a half years back. Next. Next. This is how it looks now. Next. Uh, this is the main banquet hall. These are other halls. Next. Uh, this is the Victoria Memorial, which got restored recently. Some of the galleries. Next. This is how it looked. Next. This is how it looks now. Actually, it had a false roofing, so that false roofing was removed and the whole grandeur of the, these galleries and halls came alive. Next. 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 This is Metcalf Hall. This is again an old building on the strands on River Hooghly in Kolkata. Uh, I'm showing you most of these buildings which are in Kolkata because the Government of India properties are in Kolkata. So next. So when we started the work, this is how it looked. Next. 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 This is how it looks now. Next. Next. Uh, we already have a permanent exhibition called Ami Kolkata. I Kolkata over there. So this is how it, how it looks. And you see these halls which you see, they are actually meant for uh, small intimate uh, cultural gatherings and we've been actually having it. And the public uh, uh, of Kolkata has really been cooperative. They've been actually organizing. Next. Uh, this is uh, the British barracks, 11 in number in the Red Fort. And uh, five of them actually already start, uh, you know, they already stand renovated. And the other six are in the process of it. They were supposed to be completed by this June end. But uh, now perhaps it will take another three or four months to get completed. Next. 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 This is the National Gallery of Modern Art, ladies and gentlemen, next to the India Gate in Delhi. Next. This is a 50 room structure. Beautiful. It's been actually restored even beyond my expectations. Believe you me, and this is also being done just recently. Next. 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 Uh, this, uh, this is called Jaipur House, actually, uh, the National Gallery of Modern Art Building. And we are actually going to inaugurate this with the uh, nine uh, treasures of India, meaning the, the nine artists which are considered national treasures. Next. So these are some of the proposed initiatives. Ladies and gentlemen, these are just indicated. I mean, I, you know, on the table, there is lots. These are just indicative. I mean, if I had gone through a proper presentation, it would have really taken long. So, so next. This is in Pondicherry. Uh, this is a school, um, about a 150-year-old school. And this is right on the seafront. Next. So this is how it looks from inside. Obviously, it needs restoration. Next. This is the government club complex again in Pondicherry. Next. This is how it would look after restoration. Next. Next. Uh, this is another place which is, uh, these are warehouses, uh, about, about I think eight of them. 
uh, in uh, uh, on the sea front just next to the pier uh, in Pondicherry. Next. This is a, a building which is almost done, uh, which again is to be put to all kinds of usage. Uh, next. So this and all is, uh, is just a snapshot which I gave you of what we are actually into. So the whole idea is that while we are restoring some buildings, we want the private sector to come in. The buildings which are not restored, we want the private sector to come in too. Uh, so that they also get to be part of that restoration, conservation. And thereafter, you see, when it becomes a cultural space through uh, incubating some startups or by bringing in um, people who, who can, who can uh, come up with sustainable revenue models, uh, the state government, the central government, the private sector, the corporate sector, we can all get together. Uh, and of course, um, keeping in mind the safety requirements in terms of financial proposition, which the uh, private or the corporate sector makes, uh, you know, evolve a, a, a revenue model which uh, satisfy, satisfies all of them. Uh, so now I actually come down to the next uh, stage where I call upon Ms. Deepa Sahi, uh, who have for you my friends, um, a highly acclaimed actor and a film and television producer. Uh, Deepa Sahi ji uh, runs uh, one of India's biggest companies uh, on animation and visual effects. She has uh, steered a heritage park initiative currently being developed at Govinda Fort on a PPD, PPP model with uh, the government of Punjab. Uh, let us hear Ms. Deepa Sahi in person on her experience working with the government. Good evening, Ms. Deepa Sahi. Thank Hello you for coming. Everyone, all the panelists and participants. Thank you, sir. So, thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, so I would actually like uh, to know, or rather the participants uh, in this webinar would like to know uh, about your project at Govindar Fort as a venture where you have put in the monies. Tell me about your experience with the government and also about the business model that has been followed. Uh, the Ford actually is not uh, a, a traditional museum space as we understand it in the sense of just being a repository of artifacts. It's more like a live cultural park where my idea is to use new technology to uh, share our entire cultural experience. Uh, so it does have uh, museums, uh, three museums currently, they want to have more. It's under development. It's a 43 acre uh, property where uh, unfortunately only nine acres so far has been developed. But uh, I do believe that uh, to make anything sustainable today, we need to bridge this gap between what is the traditional culture or culture handed down to us and the new generation, which is completely brought up on several satellites. Uh, and we need to make whole experience immersive and interactive and only then it can arrive at a sustainable model so that is the attempt uh, already in the nine acres that we have developed so far we have uh, some of the technology used a 7d technology as well as projection mapping for so some vr ar uh, and our attempt is to um, recreate the entire experience of history uh, for the audience. About 10 lakh people have come in so far and about 70,000 Ma'am, uh, can, can you tell me what exactly has been your learning from this venture? In the sense, suppose if you had to uh, put this whole thing uh, to a review, uh, would you sort of, uh, could you think of, or perhaps have you all already thought of something which is a better revenue model? Uh, or in your uh, view, what could be perhaps the ideal thing? I think basically, uh, as you rightly know, in India at least, uh, most of these uh, historic places belong to the state or the government. So the uh, private partners, uh, the kind of partnership that is formed between the government and the private sector, I think these are early days and there are lots of teething problems and the government itself is currently not really uh, really used to working uh, with the private partners. And I think that whole 
uh, system needs a bit of polishing in terms of uh, traditionally see the governments uh, because they are dealing with uh, taxpayers money there is this attitude of largesse uh, towards the private sector as if it is a um, something they have to give out and you mean like la 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 landlord yes like yes the landlord yes, relationship the uh, which needs to change it needs to be a true partnership relationship and i think we will arrive at that uh, slowly this is also the first time i have worked with the government so for me also it was a new experience the other thing yeah. is you know we need to arrive uh, not just uh, in terms of uh, legalities uh, which are genuinely of a partnership nature and not like a tenant landlord relationship because it can be beneficial for both the segments if it is a genuine partnership but as as we have seen in other segments like my favorite example is the titan which uh, has been done uh, in the south you know it's a genuine partnership relationship and i think if we work a little more sit down with the lawyers and take the concerns of the government we can easily arrive at a model which actually financially benefits both the segments so basically you are actually uh, uh... Voicing the same kind of sentiments which I just voiced about five minutes back, but see, one more thing, has, one more thing. If I'm not being very inquisitive, uh, mm -hmm. ma'am, can you tell me the if I'm not? I mean, you you are free to say no, but uh, what has been the quantum of your investment in this project? Well, so far it has not been earth shattering. I've put in about twenty five crores so far. Uh, going forward, we it's going to be hundred plus crores as we get more land. um and uh, the thing is i studied it a lot before deciding this because the business unless this model is viable or financially it is going to die soon death <coughs> so uh, i will shock you by telling you that even in 9 acres uh, last two months before covid we had become ebitda positive uh, so imagine what is going to happen when the whole thing works so provided uh, see india has many peculiar realities so you have to um uh, like uh, you can't have sip tickets that's why i think even a person like uh, an organization experience organization like disney does not enter here because the indian uh, people cannot pay those kind of high rates and tickets so you have to have a very flexible pricing policy a variable policy you have to have many experiences uh the other thing i have discovered is that most of the out of home uh, activities in india are actually governed by children which was a new learning for me i mean i knew that the new generation is important but the way the uh, uh, football swing uh, with the exam times of the kids is very crazy uh, okay yeah okay. you know so um uh, sai actually we are a little um, short on time but we really gained from your uh, first hand uh, recounting your experiences uh, thank you for sharing them uh, ma'am now uh, i come to our panelists uh, of the day and i start with uh, mr abhishek podar mr abhishek podar i have uh, can we go to mr abhishek podar good evening good evening ji good evening mr podar uh the first question which i have for you is uh that on march 20th this year um uh, after the onset of covid uh, a board of consortium of funders including bloomberg the ford foundation and the melton foundation launched a multi million uh, covid response and impact fund to support the city's cultural and social organizations as someone with an experience uh, in uh, funds for arts do you think it is possible to inspire similar action in the indian context i'd like to start by saying that even pre covid we didn't have any funds for the arts and getting it post covid i it's definitely needed it's needed much more now than we needed before but i think we got to look at funding for the arts from the ground up uh, even if you look at csr which has been mandated now for the last 5 years roughly 1% of the csr budget goes towards art culture and heritage and i suspect this year when uh, csr spending itself would be down
same one percent, it comes down to half a percent that we could get. So I think a huge amount needs to be done, and um, it's great that the government is taking the initiative to speak to the private sector and engage the private sector in initiatives. Even this webinar itself is a great step in that direction. But I think clear policies need to be made to encourage this, not only in the time of a pandemic like this, but in a normal course as well. You know, uh, you, you talked about the um, uh, CSR uh, aspect, the corporate social responsibility. Uh, you know, how does one uh, make, uh, you know, these public institutions, uh, you know, how does the, uh, the private sector and the corporate sector become partners in developing them, developing these public sector institutions. Uh, when I talk about institutions, I, I don't only mean the museums. Uh, I'll come to that later. But suppose if you took cultural spaces, like for example, I showed you some cultural spaces in Pondicherry. Now, how can one sort of become partner, not through the aspect of CSR, but by seeing in those cultural spaces a, a, a kind of a, how should I put it, uh, you know, as a, as a business proposition, uh, you know, where if, if the state government or the central government comes and sort of uh, liaises with uh, the private and the, and the corporate sector, how, how would they find them uh, to be a better proposition to invest in? So I think uh, the difference is, if you're really looking at energizing these spaces, we've got to first take the first step of making them places which become community spaces where people want to come. And once that is done, automatically business would come there because you're going to need so many ancillary things. But I think uh, most corporates are not in the business of culture. And uh, they like to come to cultural spaces because these are spaces which become uh, places where these discussions happen and where people want to congregate and therefore it becomes a business opportunity for them. Uh, so I think, I mean, if you look at a Bikaner house, for example, in Delhi, that's been a fantastic model where everybody wants to come there and do events. But I think the creation of these spaces is the most important thing to start with. And today, um, if somebody is going to be in the business of culture, then I think promoting culture and being in the business of culture might actually be a conflict. So you need to make culture happen and then business will follow. I mean, uh, there's a quote that I'd like to say here, which Michael Bloomberg had told me when I'd gone to him for funding. And after looking at the map proposal, he says, you know, and I think it's really true because he went on to say, if you look at the Middle East, how many people who are there, I mean, they've got all the capital, but they're having to buy culture. We have all the culture, but we are not doing very much to exactly. protect it or preserve it or promote it. Exactly. So, so when you give the example of Bikaner House, just next to that place is, is the Jaipur House, which has been now done up. But then alongside the Jaipur House, which is far bigger uh, and now perhaps much better conserved, uh, we also have the temporary exhibition galleries. And uh, in the basement, a lot of space which the government's going to actually come up with uh, and work with the, the, the corporate sector and the private people uh, for holding events. Um, so I'll come back to you, Abhishek, a little later. Uh, now I go to my second panelist, uh, Mr. Brendan Siako, who's joining us from Boston. Good morning, uh, Brendan. Uh, you, know, you have talked about uh, museums becoming more agile, digital and data driven. Can we have Brendan? Uh... Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good, good, good morning. Uh, so uh, the museums becoming more agile, digital and data driven by experimenting with techniques uh, borrowed from the startup and the tech world and uh, influencing the marketing strategy and exhibition design, building new revenue streams and so on. Uh, as someone who has, who's operated at the intersection uh, of all this, what kind of capacity building do you think is required for museums and museum professionals in these days of COVID? Well, as someone who straddles between multiple sectors like museums, startups, and technology, I'm frequently researching and writing about 
the increasingly blurring lines, um, you know, between the silos and the influence that startups and technology culture have on the more traditional cultural sector. But I think it comes as no surprise, um, you know, one area that is very underdeveloped for museums and cultural organizations is digital literacy across all departments. And I know there are currently major efforts in the United States and in the United Kingdom and other countries to build capacity in this area, but globally there's really a long way to go. But it's a important, you know, it's important to note that digital isn't just a baseline understanding of how to use software and the internet. It's a complete way of thinking about research and development. It's a complete way of thinking about internet culture, experience design and communication. And the more your directors your governments, your curators, your staff are tuned into these mindsets, the better they'll be equipped to move forward in an increasingly digital world. And on top of this, I believe that the cultural sector would benefit from basic uh, product management. Um, in, in business and in other sectors and in other industries, often product management lives at the intersection of customer experience, the business or back office and the and technology. So having the ability to connect the dots between these areas is, is going to be vital to finding success post pandemic and beyond. And also last year, there was a study that showed that companies with more uh, digital savvy board members. So now I'm looking at board members had higher revenue and higher growth as compared to their counterparts. So I'm confident that, you know, this same notion applies to the cultural sector. So making sure that you have a digitally competent and tuned in board of advisors, trustees, not just your core staff is of significant importance, um, especially now that new disruptions have arrived on the scene. So you are on mute, uh, sir. Mr. Singh, you are on mute. If we, if we, yeah, yeah. If we, if we have a, uh, an exhibition on say, uh, manuscripts or on textiles, uh, then uh, perhaps uh, what you mean is that we would need to have virtual um, uh, walkthroughs of those galleries or uh, uh, perhaps um, uh, an interplay of technology on the digital platform, um, which would perhaps uh, over a period of time uh, acquire a more significance than the physical aspect of that display? Is that what you mean, uh, Brendan? Not necessarily. I think it goes without saying that uh, digital access is of growing in importance, um, but it's not about uh, one or the other. It's about a hybrid. And what I'm trying to underscore is it's the, the mindset, the comfort, the familiarity of your staff to think about digital access moving forward. So I would almost argue that your curator of manuscripts, your curator of textiles should have a certain level of baseline digital understanding. So when they think about how they will interpret that collection, how they will distribute that collection, they're thinking about it from a holistic perspective of not just that this visitor or this audience member is coming physically to the museum, but what channels they can leverage to get that in front of as many people globally as possible. So it's, it's as uh, internal as it is external. Do I want to ask? Yeah, you were on mute. I'm sorry. Can we uh, can we go to Bose? Bose, uh, the uh, Biennale of Sydney, has uh, just now uh, uh, become the first major international art show to go to go virtual through the Google Art and Culture platform. Bose, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah right. So, you know, the Biennale at Sydney has become the first major international art show to go virtual. Um, since the COVID limits our ability to travel and may have a long-term impact on travel behavior, how do you think it will impact your long-term vision? You know, when, when we talk about the Kochi Uh Thank you for inviting me to be part of this. It is wonderful to uh, talk to, you know, uh, listen to Brandon and, you know, Abhishek's point of view and, you know, others and waiting to hear. But I touch upon, you know, before going to 
questions to me, I would like to go into, uh, you know, Abhishek, you know, connecting with his uh, answer. I would like to suggest that our national culture funds are inevitable when we talk about uh, not the national culture fund. Just like Germany now, the German parliament has approved a 9% of increase in federal spending on culture, uh, bringing the total budget of 1.8 billion euro and more. So I think, you know, like uh, it is inevitable our, uh, our nation, uh, nation building. It is the kind of revival uh, from all this uh, pandemic after the pandemic period. I'm sure culture can bring much more. I think you know, we have to be able absolutely. To You're so correct. You're so correct that the national aspect. culture fund and, needs to be. Yeah. That is that is that is very much within our uh, our radar screen. And uh, yeah, and talking about uh, Sydney, Sydney Biennale. I believe that you know after 10, 10 days of the exhibition opened, you know they closed down, right? And uh, I. I was in Sydney earlier for that earlier biennial. It is one of the finest uh, experiential places like the Cockatoo Island or when you uh, move to uh, the garage spaces and the museum spaces. And it is curated by an incredible artist, uh, Brooke Andrew. Unfortunately, uh, it had to shut down and you had to go through virtual reading and viewing. Um, it is. The physicality, the scale of it becomes almost kind of, almost like a miniaturist uh, experience as you get it. I don't know how can you experience such, uh, uh, such spaces when it comes to uh, augmented. It is not augmented, it is a kind of virtual travel. And also when, uh, when we talk about the Sydney Vinyl, uh, Google Art and Culture is first international project on temporary Biennale's was Kochi in 2012. So you can see uh, the virtual reality and virtual travel. Uh, you can go through the Kochi Biennale's 2012, 14, and 16 in in our you know in their link. So so basically, what you're saying. Uh, so basically, what you're saying, Bose, is that it will impact. It has to impact because a miniaturist experience of what you feel through various senses will obviously not be possible just through virtual interaction. I, 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 I believe that physicality is important when it comes no, no. to... Understandable, uh, understandable. Physicality and Benali is a temporal project. It is a temporary museum Absolutely. project. I would say it's a kind of museum, temporary museum. Benali is a temporary museum. Yes. And the, it is, the physicality is important. Of course, accepting and understanding the virtual aspects uh, in present time. Uh, we can be, our artists are also incorporated in the finale is also created uh, uh, virtual, virtual reading or online uh, exhibition. Um, there are uh, lots of artists are also work the uh, same uh, line of, uh, you know, like this period of pandemic period uh, or the, the COVID period, you know, I think, uh, we we are looking back to uh, the online reading you know it was from years ago it was started but you know like we are taking it a little more seriously personally yeah, thank you thank you thank you thank you boss I'll, I'll i'll come back to you uh, in, in a short while uh, so now i i go to sanjoy roy uh, sanjoy this year you introduced the online jaipur literary festival brave new world series uh, do you see that as the future of the festival or is this a kind of a stopgap arrangement? It's like a question related to what I just asked both because both of you are in the, in the business of organizing these huge uh, uh, events. Uh, or is this the dawn of the online cultural spaces and if so, have you devised any model in which this can be monetized? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Before I come to that answer, I just want to reflect on what everybody else has said. And, and thank you for creating this webinar. And if you look at the question and answer segment, you see a lot of concerns out there. And just for a second to address that, I think this is a time that we know that in India, the space for culture has long been vacated. 
and it's really private players, whether it's the Mehrangarh Museum or the City Palace, Udaipur, or Jatin Das Museum at Bhubaneswar, or Patna, or Jaya Jaitli Singh, the new museum that she's looking at. It's also these museums that have really come in. And if you see Rajasthan in the last uh, term, they really opened up places, whether it was Nahargarh for the installation park, et cetera, and created a phenomenal appetite for something going forward. And this perhaps is the time, uh, Mr. Singh, where if government can come together with private players, so you marry passion and you marry your vision of getting things done and try and match this in some way. We know that the arts need resources. Yes, government doesn't have all the resources, but at least come together. So perhaps the, the corollary to this should be uh, getting all of these people together and we'll come to that. To answer your specific question, and thank you for that, you know, uh, the Jaipur Literature Festival and most of our 33 odd festivals across the world have always been captured live and we have projected this on uh, a digital platform or the other. What, has, what is new is that we've used this opportunity, the opportunity of this present crisis and Every crisis, I think, presents an opportunity. So you can, you know, chati pito, or you can say, hey, how can I envision the future? And in envisioning the future, we created JLF Brave New World, as we have a number of new cultural digital products. Will this be the way forward forever? I hope not, because at the end of the day, as you and I know, to create a memory or to embed a memory into a person, it's really when you go to the Taj Mahal, you may have seen it a million times on a photograph, but it's when you go there and you're awestruck by the beauty, by the unparalleled beauty of it. That's what embeds the memory. And I hope that these exercises that we're doing, which is on the digital platform, allows you to build community, but also allows you to take India's incredible diversity length and breadth of its science and education and knowledge and historicity and deep culture across the world. And that's what the effort is. Uh, Bose, can I, can I come back to you once more? Uh, and uh, uh, this is just to say that Kochi Biennale uh, has been a great experiment in bringing in crowdfunding to support and let the public at large become a stakeholder by taking ownership of uh, uh, Kochi uh, Biennale. Uh, you know, it is an initiative where the public-private partnership has been a success. At a policy level, what can be done to encourage such initiatives is what I want to ask this. I think, uh, I think culture is, is last in the list of sectors where CSR funding occurs. The government can no, I, I, boss, boss, you know, the, the thing is, we are all here. I come back to money because it's just the most uh, necessary thing to, you know, when you think about a cultural project. Uh, culture is, we have incredible culture, but when it implementing uh, the cultural wealth into the public, it's important to talk about that. You know. Sorry, sir, I have to come back to uh, the financial part of it. The government can and should encourage more support in the sector. It should also act as a facilitator for the sharing of resources between not only cultural organizations, but also companies that deal in technology, infrastructure, production centers, Art residencies, etc. I want to. I want to know what your what your experience or what your challenges have been while you sort of went about making a success of your venture. That's what I want to know. The success is actually it is people's participation, and of course, how do you uh, manage to get it? participation? How do you bring uh, people to uh, a uh, a temporary museum exhibition space, or we call it Benale? Nobody was aware of that word itself in Kerala. Uh, or in Kochi. And now it is the location, the site is an important aspect when you think about the project. It is almost like uh, uh, it's a culture project like this or a festival like this is like almost like an acupuncture. It can cure, it can, uh, you know, 
it can give a revival capacity uh, to the location. Also, the success is its sustainability through architecture. And we reuse the architectural spaces in 4.5 square kilometer area in, uh, in Kochkin and Matancheri spaces. When I talk about Matancheri and Kochi, its own historical part is important. And also the success is definitely with the help of patrons. You know, like we have incredible patron and we have one person is here, Abhishek is also a huge patron of Kochi Biennial. He got, his properties have been uh, given out for exhibition spaces. And like that, you know, we, uh, we have uh, support comes from maybe everybody. Uh, the people turned out to be, uh, the visitors turned out to be ambassadors of the biennial because of the site play a celestial or a kind of emotional, uh, a humane touch. You know, that is what I think, you know, uh, the, uh, the ingredients are quite a lot, but, you know, I, I think people made it uh, make uh, biennials, people make it uh, uh, creative spaces. Uh, I think that human factor is very important. Uh, how, how we work with uh, a local, national, and general, and at the same time, international is there very much aware of why this Biennale is getting more attention to, uh, because I think uh, consistently we have at least the uh, average level of 5,000 to 7,000 people visit our Biennale. So, so far we had more, you know, we are working on the Biennale, which will open on 12th of December this year, and for uh, 120 days. Um, we had only 90 days, the Biennale was only, when we started thinking about the Biennial, we had only 90 days. And we had this tradition, we had 400,000 people visited from everywhere. And there is a kind of enthusiasm and inquisitiveness provided the site and the historicity provided to that you know, site, which, which is definitely enriched. Uh, so basically it's the perseverance, we persevered. And I believe state government also has been quite... Yeah, it is a very important aspect, you know, like that funding. When we talk about funding, the state was the first, first initial, initial funding was done by the state. And it's consistently give it. What is the success is also when government is part of it. You know, we have the complete autonomy of decision making when it comes to creativity. That freedom we have taken. Uh, we have you know, taken it from the government and the government is uh, continuously supporting. Understandable, so I understandable. Not enough. I think I would like, I would like uh, the, the center is part of it, you know. It, you know, we should have. That's, that's, like, that's the reason why we're discussing yeah, all this. A cultural model, there. like a manifesta, like European model kind of manifesta in different, different cities to cities. Like manifesta is a country to country and in is almost like a continent, you know, we have Many, many states. And so, Bos, uh, I will, I will, I'll have to stop you here because yeah. we are just running out of time. But great listening to you. I'll come back to you again. Now, I go to uh, Brendan. Uh, Brendan, uh, you know the Indian museums uh, have largely not experimented with admission and membership models. Um, do you really think uh, museums can compete and become part of a month-to-month -month subscription economy? Um, you know, like the way uh, Netflix operates, or uh, like the way like the way the Spotify operates. Um, how do cultural institutions uh, stand out in digital? Is going to be more competitive and cluttered in the near future. That's a great question. Well, I want to I want to acknowledge that Indian museums aren't alone. The vast majority of global museums, including American museums, haven't yet experimented with these models and only a select few number of organizations have implemented month-to-month -month recurring membership models or even dynamic pricing. We've, we've started to hear be partially because of the pandemic that a small but growing number of museums are starting to explore flexible membership tiers, um, you know, again, which has all been prompted by the, the urgency and necessity. Um, but We've already heard that dynamic ticketing and admission pricing is going to be gaining more and more momentum as a means of helping crowd control. Um, so fluctuating by time of day um, and demand, not unlike we see with ride sharing um, apps and airlines, but um, both of these moves are connected 
uh, to museums, of course, needing to upgrade some of their technology infrastructure and their openness uh, to experimenting with some of these figures. The tools that they've been uh, using to handle simple things like admissions and membership transactions, um, but also this very much ties back to the original question about making strides toward be towards becoming data-driven and reactive uh, to the context around them. But you asked how museums can compete with Netflix and Spotify and other entertainment platforms, which do have monthly subscription models. You know, this has always been the, the billion dollar question. So I think museums should, should aim to be digital forward and leverage user-friendly platforms when possible. But we need to acknowledge that Netflix is a mass consumer entertainment company. They're not mission-driven heritage, you know, organizations. And it's also worth mentioning that Netflix in, you know, 2019 spent two and a half billion dollars just in marketing, just in marketing. So it's less about how you compete with these entertainment channels. It's, it's more how can you be as effective as, as you can responding to the needs of your audience, delivering on your mission. And with that all said, there might be some things you can learn. So I think it's more important than it's ever been to leverage digital channels to reach new audiences, but there's never been more competition for the consumer's attention as there is today. So for this reason, um, you know, and there's really no sim simple single answer, um, museums must start experimenting to find what is successful for them. So it's going to vary case to case. Okay, so a related question, uh, Abhishek, I wanted to ask you uh, is that any thoughts on introducing membership or loyalty programs in Indian museums? In fact, you have one of your own museum uh, <clears throat> on art and photography coming up, Abhishek. Yeah, so we do have uh, plans to have a membership model. I think initially, we need to first build an audience. So the membership is never going to be a revenue generating thing for an audience. We're also so conscious of pricing that we are going to keep affordable. And uh, I think this is something that other museums worldwide have done quite effectively. So we are doing that. We're also looking at a tiered membership model. We would be having corporate memberships and we would be having different levels of membership depending on the kind of benefits that you would get. That's very much on the cards. Oh, good. Uh, so Sanjoy, uh, can you tell me um, if you agree with the, with the idea that uh, cultural products and services, uh, which are uh, expected to be free, how does one go about uh, doing uh, expectation mapping uh, with the audience? What role does branding and communication play in uh, financial sustainability of the cultural uh, institutions? It's, it's absolutely vital, uh, Raghavendra. And if you remember when you all did uh, at the National Museum, when you did the, the wonderful exhibition of the Nizam's Jewels or the Picasso exhibition, Look at the way it just converted your museum space. And it was effective messaging and communication that got people to the door. Similarly, even with the Harappan, your recent Harappan thing, it was actually the controversy that perhaps got people to the door rather than the other way around. But in all of this, I think, you know, most museums or most cultural institutions look at a one third, one third, one third um, income stream. So one third from corporate support, sponsorship, so on and so forth, one third from uh, ticketing, um, uh, 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 membership, etc. And then one third through rentals, events, uh, uh, you know, other occasions where you can lend the backdrop of the cultural heritage space. Uh, you look at all three and then you throw in there merchandising and all the value driven stuff. You need a wonderful cafe, you need restaurants, you need, you need it to be a place where people can come to irrespective. The minute you start doing that, either online or in person, you know that you've won half the battle. And in order to do that, as you know, being from government, how vital communication is. And without clear, I mean, precise communication, none of this can happen. And we can see it in the time of COVID, how been, the communication has been so short to pieces. 
And that's the important thing. Design, look and feel. You know, uh, uh, you see, the reason why we chose uh, this topic for a discussion today is that the times are challenging. And as perhaps you only said, that if times are challenging, uh, it's, it's rather than be cynical or rather than be, um, uh, you know, in a, in a state where you, you sort of give in to the situation, you try and come up to these challenges. Uh, with that in mind, my, my final uh, question to all the speakers, to all the panelists over here is, uh, your final thoughts on making cultural institutions financially resilient in terms of capacity building of professionals, um, uh, digital strategies, building corpuses with the help of private players and any policy gaps that you see with respect to all these. Why I say this is that all this put together actually poses a huge challenge for us. But that doesn't mean that, you know, we say that, you know, if, else except if government does everything, we can't do anything. Because if that be the, the whole approach, then perhaps uh, things will become slightly more difficult. So with all this in mind, uh, uh, you know, uh, can I ask both Krishna Machari to come in first on, on all this? Uh, there are many ways we can uh, enrich uh, and revive uh, uh, our cultural institutions in, uh, in uh, national uh, festivals as well. We have 29 states. I would, I would say that, you know, uh, when we look at China, they have built hundreds of museums. But I won't say that we should make hundreds of museums, but it, at least we should make it 29 uh, contemporary art, art spaces uh, to 29 states. Also, this, as I mentioned earlier, the festivals can be uh, cities to cities, like the Manifesta model of European uh, uh, biennial model. You know, it can move to one place to the another. For this, I think, Financial model needs to the endowment, the national endowment, state endowment, and district, as well as even the panchayat level. We should work from the ground level to the, the top. And PPP model can be one of the finest model. And you know, Kochi is also in that sense. You know, there are CSR funds. You know, the Tata Trust is hugely supportive. Our vertical, other verticals like the students' finale, HCL support. Um, you know, there is, the CSR funds are very important and also the, I think it is important to uh, raise uh, cultural funding, like uh, I was talking about the German, Germans, how they have done it now. Uh, when we look at the nation, there are incredible wealth we have it. We don't know how to package it. We don't know how to, how to uh, promote our own uh, cultural wealth. Um, that's what, you know, I can go on talking about it, you know. <laughs> can I have uh, Abhishek come in on uh, what I just asked? Uh, if things are a little more specific, rather than, uh, you know, what should be. Uh, the idea is that, you know, we are gathered together here to come up with something specific. If, if we have something specific and positive, which is practical and feasible, perhaps uh, it would serve the purpose a lot more. So Abhishek, I think um, we can. It's not a very difficult thing to do. Uh, Private-public partnership is an important route, and it's the only way this thing can go forward. And let's face it, the government will always be the big brother. The government government has a much larger um, vested interest in this because a corporate may be around for 20 years, 50 years. The country remains forever. If we take pride in our culture, in our art, in our heritage, we would do what's needed. Maybe we need to, uh, we've done so many different policies, but where are we encouraging what needs to be there for culture? I think we need to also incentivize corporates who are looking at doing this. Today, why is there only 1% funding in this particular sector? Sorry, there is only 0.1% Abhishek. It's 0 0.1 when you take the national budget, but not yeah. when you take corporate CSR. There it's close to 1%. It's about 0.8%. So I think if you incentivize, people will do it. 
and at the end of the day who's not going to be interested in their own culture but unless we first start taking pride in that so i think yeah. that's the real thing so one it's a mindset shift and it's another mindset shift as to how philanthropy is done in our country why is it that you don't have to go around the same way the, the exact example that you gave at the beginning about ford foundation and bloomberg and mellon coming together to put this up is because they take pride in that and they have an incentive in doing so so if that is provided here i have no doubt that we can revive and we can have the real focus that is needed here so uh brendan uh, as a person who's uh, looking at india uh, what would you say to to what i just asked yeah i i think this is probably one of the most important yet complex questions on everyone's mind right now especially as the pandemic has raised questions about lost revenue questions about new revenue streams questions about financial strains and pressures on the funding landscape um i am a firm believer that museums and cultural institutions can apply some entrepreneurial principles to drive innovation and transform themselves into you know more modern organizations especially right now and if you you know i i think that if you do things traditionally you can expect traditional outcomes and i think right now we need everything but traditional and the organizations that are looking to the future and driving the greatest impact are those that have embraced some of these agile entrepreneurial mindsets in some capacity it's the entrepreneurial spirit uh moving forward that could be by increasing uh focus on new partner de uh development greater willingness to experiment um including the increasing presence of those that have invented the future on your boards and teams so i would always be asking myself what actions can my institution or my government or my ministry of culture take for these organizations and the culture that they they hold to stand the test of time who should i be talking to and for for india specific you know in addition to your culture one of india's greatest assets is obviously its people india is one of the global leaders in the cultivation and generation of innovation and i'm not even scratching the surface when i ask you this question what do the ceos of google microsoft and adobe all have in common it's india so if you're looking at innovation and financial models especially in this time of uncertainty or really any time for that matter i think there is a great opportunity to engage those who have successfully built or or created new business models in this digital age and you'll likely increase the chances of successfully navigating the next decade the next century of your cultural sector so the answer might be you know right in your hands thank you thank you brendan uh sanjoy um sanjoy you and uh, and and um, some others and the fiki team have actually been interacting with um on 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 the on the policy issues keeping that in view uh would you have anything to say uh in a, in a concrete sort of a way on what i just asked i mean five five points ragvendra point number 1 is smart city program every smart city must become an art city and government must demarcate an area within the smart city which becomes a space for cultural centers for museums etc and that cannot be sold at commercial prices it should be given to those organizations institutions at 1 rupee 1 dollar whatever second a tax holiday 30 years give them a tax holiday to be able to invest in that infrastructure third those people who are investing into culture and i am separating culture from us for a second from say temple building or education institution building in the same way that they get tax benefits in these two areas culture to must get cash uh, tax benefits from that area a uh, fourth csr very specifically culture must be written into csr objectives and as long as that is done in the same way that say prime minister's fund or covid or education or whatever it is and so do that and the fifth is actually a very ex interesting example that brazil does so in brazil the local trade association so say uh, defense colony association and lajpat nagar each of them would have a tax on every product that they sell which goes directly to supporting 
the cultural center, the gymnasium, uh, and the library in that locality or in that district. So in this way, you're not necessarily saying, you know, you have to put out, you're saying let the, let the community support uh, the cultural sector. And what that's done, as you know, uh, Brazil looks at its culture, you've seen the way that it celebrates not just the carnival, but everything associated with that, some of the best dance companies, best theater companies, best music and samba, all of this comes, why? Because they get rehearsal space, they get basic support. Through the year, 365 days in a year, they're allowed to perform in these multiplicity of spaces, whether it's in a favela or whether it's in, uh, in a district center. And these are some of the best practices which I would certainly afford to you all. And I think the most, un most important underlining thing as you know, Raghavendra, most of the time when anybody goes to government, they will tell you 20 reasons why something can't be done. Now with you there, if you tell us 20 reasons why we should do something and walk that extra mile, not just that extra yeah, mile, yeah, yeah. cross the bridge with us, come to the other side, come over from the dark <laughs> side to our side. I think collectively we will be able to make a huge difference. No, no I, I, I quite appreciate what you just said, specifically in terms of uh, uh, the points which you just made. Uh, they've all been uh, noted down. Uh, and as we have discussed in the last one hour, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have actually just seen, having received um, uh, a huge number of suggestions, questions, some of them which we have identified, which we will uh, actually pose to our panelists uh, while we uh, take this session forward. But uh, to sum up uh, the uh, discussion with panelists, uh, I would say that the government would uh, soon enough uh, think in terms of bringing a policy on all the, all the issues which confront us at this moment in terms of uh, uh, specificities. Uh, and, uh, you know, have a standard operating procedure. Suppose if there is a cultural space, how we make use of it, uh, whether in terms of uh, MOUs, whether in terms of legal vetting, what is allowed, what is not, uh, <clears throat> and uh, develop, uh, uh, you know, as you rightly said, uh, Sanjoy, in um, uh, smart city uh, uh, projects, if we, if we just take that as, a, as an example, we can have several uh, several cities which we can take it up for development and 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 with the help of uh, uh, private sector and with the help of corporate sector as also by strengthening institutions like the national culture fund which Bose uh, pointed out um, so all these things would uh, shortly be on the anvil um, ladies and gentlemen because that's what we, uh, we plan to do uh, so now um, what I'll do is I will actually uh, go to certain questions which have been asked of us and uh, pose it to our panelists. So uh, one which goes out first to Brendan is from Mr. Chanchal Sanyal. He is the Managing Director of Q Q QED Productions Private Limited. He says that like the physical space uh, was being available for physical events, is there a plan to create a virtual space which could then be rented? Brendan. Yeah, um, so right now we're starting to see uh, an ever-growing number of uh, cases of museums and cultural institutions and festivals turning to digital platforms um, for you know, immersion, for distribution of these uh, exhibitions of these performances and so on. The big question remains um, on the topic of monetizing these virtual spaces. Um, there's a lot of work happening in the for-profit or commercial um, art fair space and art, mar art market space about uh, the term is online viewing rooms. Um, but there's likely going to be someone for profit or non profit or something in between that uh, creates some sort of culture specific uh, environment for people to engage uh, with exclusive content in a way that generates uh, revenue. One thing that I saw 
uh, just the other day um, in the Telegraph was they were claiming, and this was backed by some study, that um, exhibitions that are exported uh, abroad via virtual reality um, are going to make hundreds of millions of dollars for uh, cultural uh, sector organizations in the United Kingdom. So if you think about that globally and you think about virtual reality as being you know, one of the next generation uh, content channels, I think there's something to be said there. But we have to take into consideration, most people do not have the hardware in any country to experience virtual reality. So I think you have to think agnostic of the, of the device and think, you know, um, what types of content are people most, um, you know, have the highest appetite for remotely um, from a cultural standpoint, whether that be symphonic music, visual arts, dance, performance, and otherwise and look for uh, ways to getting it to as many people as possible. So I do think it can be done. I know from what I'm hearing in the museum sector specifically and the uh, art fair sector, that there are platforms starting to, you know, starting to grow, starting to, to make way. So I think it's very likely, especially given uh, the, you know, the closures um, and even at reopening of any of these fairs or festivals or institutions, limited capacity is going to be a reality. So it is very, you know, very um, certain that there needs to be some way to get your content to people and the only avenue you have is for people. Uh, so uh, Brendan, you just stay online because Rashmi Dhanwani Director, Artex Company has uh, again uh, asked a question, which perhaps you could answer the best. And she says that getting audiences to physical museums and revenue generation around existing models is a challenge. Uh, how does one look at these same concerns in digital models? Yeah, that's a it's a very very timely question, and my, my team at QZAM we've been hosting uh, webinars each week on a variety of different topics that are being expressed as you know area for concern, areas for um, inquiry across the field. And last week, last Wednesday, the topic was uh, digital. Uh, revenue generation on top of these virtual channels and there surprisingly there aren't many examples but there are starting to be um, instances where museums are uh, doing pay what you want uh, model so basically rather than putting a price tag on your content which which instantly makes it um, you know difficult to get to the masses and difficult for mission delivery um, give people the option to choose what they might be able to pay. If someone is unable to pay, they still have access to the content, but people who do have um, the ability, the means, the circumstance to support your organization, that might be $1, that might be $20. Um, so it's a, it's a good time to experiment with that. And there's also very, um, I wanna say, peculiar or, or untraditional uh, um, approaches happening there. Where I remember years ago, the Van Gogh Museum um, over in uh, the Netherlands, they were starting to basically monetize the expertise of their staff through consulting. And, and more recently, we've started to see some of that emerge digitally, where if you have world-class curators or programming in a certain department, there might be demand for that, which is an additional diversified revenue stream in this time. So started to see um, you know, more and more examples of that, but it's still early days. I would encourage anybody who's considering this to continue to put out more content and, and start to slowly phase in a pay what you want model. Sanjoy, uh, can, you, can I have you on the screen, Sanjoy? Um, yep. the, the question is from uh, Ms. Shubha Banerjee. She is the President um, Secretariat Museum Education Officer and she asks that in the post-COVID-19 scenario, every museum needs to have a strong online presence. What should be the strategy to develop the digital infrastructure in small museums around India? 
Sanjay. It it is a it is a it is a complex it's a complex process, and I wouldn't necessarily say rush into it because every museum will have to create a digital platform, which is expensive. What instead I would say is it possible to work with government, IGC, IGNC, national museum? Don't you think? Don't you think collaboration? Don't you think collaboration yeah, is absolutely. a good idea? Collaborate, create one fundamental platform, and on that platform you can have different pages going to different museum places where you're able to digitally capture what you have. Create the most importantly, create the knowledge, the backend knowledge for it. The problem that we have in museums today is that you may have the object, but that's where it's it ends. You don't have the knowledge base behind it. So you need to develop that, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't certainly advise every small museum to do their own thing. I would say to a collective, collaborative platform and work from there. Then you look like Sahapedia does, for example, or like the museum depicts in the UK has done, and. Just today in the morning, I, I've aggregated something that we'd been working with, you know, because of my long hair, I advised the museums in the UK uh, and had sent uh, uh, Mr. Raghavinder Singh a sort of document as to what's the way forward, you know, and how do, we, how do we look at that? Because finally, at the end of the day, you must also remember that seeing the object viscerally is what embeds that memory. And I'll go back to the memory point. So. Collaboration, as you said, I think is key. You know, in fact, uh, uh, going by my own experience, I'd like to share it with the participants that uh, the central government is directly mandated to look after a couple of museums like the National Museum here in Delhi or the National Gallery of Varna, the Indian Museum, the Victoria Memorial, the Salar Jang Museum, Hyderabad, and a couple of others. Now, what I I actually realize that we need to have actually a centralized team uh, which we are creating and we, we are actually in the process of creating uh, which would only deal with collaborations and collaborations between our own uh, institutions and uh, with the other institutions. And obviously to start with even at our own level we are finding it slightly difficult. Uh, because people are very comfortable in their own, uh, you know, uh, zones and arenas. So if I tell some museum that why don't you share whatever collection you have with the other museum, or in terms of whatever inventory do you have, you have with the others, we find it very difficult to do that. So even internally within our own setup, if we find it difficult, you, you know, so collaboration is obviously a new initiative uh, on which we need to think and ponder and try and encourage it. Uh, there is uh, another question which I've got from Rahul Shukla, who's a project engineer uh, from the City Palace Museum Udaipur. And uh, he asks Abhishek Udar that what will be the plan for museums to survive for next six months? There'll be no dearth of tourists, but the, there'll be severe dearth of tourists. But the expenses will be the same as salaries of staff, conservation work, maintaining the property and other activities. So he says, what is the timeline for the next six months? Very challenging. Abhishek. Well, I have an, the answer, but I, I definitely have a response. I think um, it's important therefore to have some kind of a uh, corpus that one can fall upon in times like this. And if we are going to be waiting just at gauge collections to see ourselves afloat, this would never be a viable model. Even at MAP, we are looking at a fairly substantial uh, endowment which could help us do this. The pricing in India is one that we have to keep so low. In fact, we're going to have certain free galleries and all our programming is free. We've been doing educational workshops, we've been doing talks, we've been doing conservation workshops. All of them have been free. We've done more than 3,000 kits so far, and we haven't yet opened. Uh, for us, we have about 32 members on staff. We've not laid off a single one, and we've not even cut a single rupee so far. Uh, we've, we're also fortunate to have amazing corporate support, and we've got a fantastic board. I cannot tell you how much they've all come to our aid at this time. 
and they've come because they believe in this passion and they want to join us in this journey. And it's not difficult to convince them if what you're doing is really worthwhile. So I think uh, I'm not sure where this money is going to come from if you don't have it. I guess you'll have to go to Sriji and ask him that question. Yeah, absolutely. So Mr. Rahul Shukla, I mean, the, the times indeed are very difficult. One will have to uh, look into uh, uh, specifics of a situation which the with the um, museum is facing uh, and uh, act accordingly. But yes, there are challenges. There's no doubting that. Uh, another related question uh, to you, Abhishek, is how can a personal house museum be financially sustainable and self-sufficient? You know, this is I from Hiram Shah. He is um, the founder, House Museum, Ahmedabad, India. Sir, I do not know how any museum can be self-sustaining unless, firstly, it's driven by a lot of passion. You can never put a value to what you're putting in and the effort and the passion that you bring to it. And I think once there's passion, you find your way around everything else. I don't think that should ever come first. Of course, you need money to do anything here. And as Bose mentioned, or in fact, even what Sanjoy has done, and if you look at both the Biennale as well as the Jaipur Literary Festival, or what we are doing at MAP, I'm not sure, I'm, to some extent, but they all started off because of a passion-related projects. Um, if it's a house museum, I would imagine cost should be relatively lower. The more personal you make it, and for anything that you're doing personally, you can charge. And there would be people who would be willing to pay for it, or should be people who are willing to pay for it. Doing a membership and keeping them engaged, rather than having them come in just once, or they being the means to your being able to do what you have to do. Instead, make them a part of the museum family to believe in your vision and to promote that going forward. Uh, Bose, uh, with a question from Sangeeta Singh, who is the assistant professor uh, from the University of Delhi, and she asks, how can museums be used as a learning resource center for teaching different disciplines at school levels? And what can be done to make museums accessible for differently able? Bose. Hi. <laughs> yeah, you know, <clears throat> I don't know how to answer it, but you know, I believe that uh, the museum is almost like a laboratory. Uh, you know, museum is also works like a kind of uh, uh, it's it's um, what's the context, and it is being built a museum, and it is. You know, if we learn it from uh, Kochi Bainil, uh, the temporary uh, museum project, in the sense, you know, we have this uh, children's pro program called ABC, Art by Children, and similarly, students, Manale. Education is one of our uh, main, uh, agenda uh, when, we, when we talk about it. Another important aid of the Kochi Bainil Foundation is, as I mentioned, education. And like our curator in 2018, Anita Dubey had said, the Biennale is a place for pleasure and pedagogy at the same time. So I think this, is, this gives an answer to, uh, but I think you know, it can continuously thinking about how the locations of museums uh, can be, uh, you know, using, using um, Educational places next to a kind of cafe where you can have a conversation space. Um, the museum is also considered by a way. I think uh, the verticals of thinking, of elaborating exhibits and cafe, and your um, you know, museum shops, and there are many, many other aspects. In coming years, 
I think there will be a kind of museums will play a kind of almost like a prayer space. It will become a kind of temple of uh, experiences. Uh, you know, people will come for come for um, spiritual experiences. Spiritual in the sense of knowledge building through through experiencing. Uh, contemporary as well as um, traditional uh, museum spaces. In fact, uh, uh, quite related to this, um, uh, we are actually planning in this, uh, you know, in our short presentation which we made on Belvedere, that building called Belvedere in Kolkata, we are planning a, a museum of the word, which is to do with uh, the, 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 the story of books, the paper, the literature, various kinds of literature. Um, so it'll, it'll en en encompass all kinds of experiences, storytelling, uh, printing, um, about libraries. Uh, so so this, this is just one example of what we are doing and it will obviously have a, a lot of uh, input, technology input. I can also adopt uh, adopt a kind of uh, you know residencies program and things like that in museum itself. Um, we Thank can you. structure it in many ways. We, we right, have, right, right. You know, we can. Yeah. Thank you, Bose. Uh, in fact, there is one question addressed to me uh, by Ms. Jaya Jaitley, founder and president of Dastakari Heart Samiti, and that question is. Will all projects have to plan for a virtual route or is there still hope for small unique museums on specialized themes uh, that can be set up in the real world? Uh, uh, Ma'am, as uh, Sanjay Roy said, and uh, most of us agree uh, and agree on, on this platform that virtual is there, of course, the trend is in treated, but uh, there is no substitute from the from the see and feel kind of a thing in actuality. Uh, so yes, um, that is an area where, uh, you know, which will expand, the virtual will expand, but it can never be a substitute for, um, for museums, for physical museums. And yes, um, we ourselves are actually setting up uh, a museum on uh, textile uh, in Kolkata, a gallery on textiles here. Um, you know, a lot of things to do with uh, handloom and handicrafts for the Northeast. Uh, uh, so all these things we are, we, are, we are doing and we would love to interact with you and uh, formulate uh, initiatives um, and collaborations with other uh, museums around the country uh, on what you just said and uh, in your field of interest. Uh, so that, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, actually brings us to an end of uh, the question answer session and um, you know this panel discussion we've actually gone on for uh, more than an hour 40 minutes since we started and uh, I am really glad to tell you that we had about 600 registrations for this webinar and as I have been speaking to you and as we have been discussing there have been a number of questions and the comments which we have received and all those comments received uh, please believe us, uh, we'll all be looked into and will form part of uh, uh, a paper which we shall prepare. And this is just the first in the series of webinars uh, on actual takeaways which we have planned. And, uh, and I'm sure uh, uh, in days to come and very shortly, we'll be actually sitting and discussing on absolute specifics, uh, meaning in terms of projects, meaning in terms of the responses from uh, um, on, on public-private partnership which we would receive um, and perhaps in uh, days to come though of course they are challenging we would come up with uh, some pilot projects and I'm sincerely hoping that those pilot projects uh, will act as catalysts uh, and would start a movement of a very robust public-private partnership and if we can do that uh, especially in these challenging times, I think uh, that be uh, one of the biggest achievements uh, of uh, the development of museums and cultural spaces wing of the Ministry of Culture.
So thank you very much for your time. Everyone, the panelists who've taken time out and the participants who've been with us uh, through these discussions. And Lalit, may I ask you now to take over and wrap up this discussion. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Lalit, you're on mute. So sorry. So this has been a, an amazing conversation and the kind of response we've got, the kind of traction we're getting on the chat box and the Q&A box is amazing. And it has opened a plethora of opportunities, business opportunities. It has kind of made us understand the way forward in terms of digital integration and how we can sustain ourselves and try and build our business in these pressure times. Mr. Singh, can I request you that you, although you've done it all through the entire conversation, but can I request you to kind of sum up the key takeaways from this discussion? So, Mr. Singh, can you hear us? You are on mute, sir. Yeah, right. Can you just just uh, put this properly? This is uh, just just one second. Just one second. It, it got unhinged. Right. So the the takeaway from this uh, discussion, to my mind, is that though the the COVID post COVID times are challenging, but what I am actually convinced about is that a public-private partnership, if the government sort of brings to the table certain projects uh, with a kind of sustainable model, which to others appears so attractive that they do not want to go the corporate social uh, responsibility way, but they want to come, if they find that coming alone is a bit of a problem, in these challenging times, well, then a consortium can be formed. Uh, the government can do a bit of uh, hand-holding subsequently or during the time when the whole uh, process is being evolved. Uh, so the idea is that based on whatever I've just discussed, uh, we've all discussed, we will actually uh, prepare a policy paper which we shall discuss amongst ourselves get agreements on whatever is practical and feasible and bring it again to, to, to the uh, stakeholders from private sector and the corporate sector, discuss it with them project wise and perhaps hope uh, that uh, you know, on some issues, in some cases, um, we are in agreement and those cases then become projects to be onboarded and to be executed with a proper time frame. So this, I think, should be the takeaway from these discussions. And that's how I plan to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Singh. And all great things come to an end. And though we would like to continue with this conversation, time's up and we can call it a day. But as Mr. Singh said that uh, his department, DMCS, the Development of Museums and Cultural Spaces, should be back very soon with another webinar to kickstart yet another discussion of museums and cultural spaces. So then, take care. Stay blessed. Stay connected. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you everyone. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.